on World News Tonight. Fixing divisions. King Charles visits the estranged Northern Ireland province as his latest visit on his tour around his new kingdom. Conflict reignited. Conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan caused tensions to rise as fears of proxy wars spread. Weather frenzy. Wacky weather continues to plague most of the west of North America as high temperatures have no signs of ending. Folklore reimagined. South Korea opens a national folk museum in Seoul in celebration of the National Chuseok Festival. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. King Charles was urged to keep up his own and his late mother's efforts towards reconciliation between the divided communities of Northern Ireland when he visited the British-run province to lead mourning for Queen Elizabeth. Touching down in Belfast, King Charles III set out on his first visit to Northern Ireland as monarch. Crowds lined the streets to greet the royal convoy, the king stopping off to greet well-wishers. A gun salute marked his arrival at Hillsborough Castle, the royal family's official residence in Northern Ireland. Speaking to a nation deeply divided over the royal family, the king said he hopes to honour his mother's legacy there. With that shining example before me, and with God's help, I take up my new duties resolved to seek the welfare of all the inhabitants of Northern Ireland. The Queen's visit to Ireland in 2011 and her handshake a year later with former IRA commander Martin McGuinness were seen as huge steps towards cementing the peace process. The House Speaker from the main nationalist party Sinn Féin paid tribute to these gestures. She personally demonstrated how individual acts of positive leadership can help break down barriers and encourage reconciliation. Queen Elizabeth showed that a small but significant gesture, a visit, a handshake, crossing the street or speaking a few words of Irish can make a huge difference in changing attitudes and building relationships. Sinn Féin boycotted the proclamation of the new king but agreed to meet him and attend some events. The King met with leaders of other faith communities ahead of a remembrance service for the Queen at Anglican Cathedral St Anne's, also attended by UK Prime Minister Liz Truss and Irish President Michael Higgins. The visit comes as unionists loyal to the Crown feel their place in the wider UK is under increasing threat, with the nationalists set to lead the devolved government in Belfast for the first time. Border clashes between Armenia and Azerbaijan have killed at least 49 Armenian troops and raised fears of another fully-fledged war in the former Soviet Union. This conflict comes as tensions further rise in the region as the Uso-Ukrainian war escalates, raising suspicions of a possible proxy war. The governments of Russia, the US and France are all calling for restraint after fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan on their shared border has killed at least 49 Armenian troops, according to the Armenian government, and raised fear of another full-fledged war in former countries of the Soviet Union. Footage released by Armenia's defence ministry is said to show Azeri soldiers in an unidentified border area. Azerbaijan says it was attacked by Armenia and sustained casualties without giving specific numbers. Armenia, however, says several towns on the border were shelled early Tuesday morning and that it responded to what it called a large-scale provocation. And in Parliament, its Prime Minister said that Azeri forces had attacked because Azerbaijan didn't want to negotiate over the status of disputed territory, Nagorno-Karabakh. That was at the centre of their last war in 2020. Russia is the main power broker in this area and has a military base in Armenia. But Azerbaijan is backed both militarily and politically by the Turkish government, a NATO member. The war they fought in 2020 lasted six weeks. Both Washington and Moscow, already dealing with the Ukraine war, issued statements stating any conflict needed to be resolved diplomatically although Turkey called for Armenia to, quote, cease its provocations. 
The last conflict was another chapter in decades of hostilities between the countries. It ended with Azerbaijan making significant territorial gains and Russian peacekeepers deployed to the area. U.S. consumer prices unexpectedly rose in the last month, despite a drop in gas prices, giving the United States Federal Reserve ammunition to deliver a third 75 basis points interest rate hike next week. This comes at a time where most countries are already facing economic crises, with the developed economies being the latest to be hit. U.S. inflation unexpectedly rose in August despite a drop in gas prices, which were offset by rising costs for rent, food and health care. That's according to the Labor Department's Consumer Price Index report on Tuesday, which showed CPI gained by 0.1 percent last month when economists were expecting it to fall by 0.1 percent. The hotter-than-anticipated report suggested that inflation could remain elevated for some time, giving the Federal Reserve reason to stay aggressive and carry out a third 75 basis point interest rate hike at its policy meeting next week. That sparked a sharp sell-off in the stock market, snapping a four-day winning streak for the major indexes. On a year-over-year -year basis, consumer prices increased by 8.3 percent, while economists were anticipating a rise of 8.1 percent, according to a Reuters poll. While the 8.3 percent reading marked a deceleration from July's 8.5 percent rise, inflation is still running way above the Fed's 2 percent target, and has remained above 8 percent for six straight months. The latest inflation numbers are a headache for the Biden administration and Democrats hoping to limit their losses in November's midterm elections. With only one more CPI report due before Election Day, it is unlikely to fall below that 8 percent level before Americans head to the polls. The United States is facing a flurry of weather woes. Wildfires continue to burn down acres worth of land, while fresh mudslides cause perilous situations through which first responders struggle to reach populations at risk. Tonight, a year of extremes in just a matter of days. Historic heat, fires, floods, and now mudslides. The volatile western weather creating havoc for first responders and dangerous conditions for those suddenly in harm's way. All these vehicles are stuck in about two feet of 20 mile an hour debris flow. Outside Los Angeles, firefighters rescued more than 50 including young families who suddenly became trapped and caked in debris as a mudslide covered a canyon road. It was terrifying. On the heels of record-shattering heat, the remnants of Tropical Storm K brought flash flooding that soaked the region, down trees, swamp neighborhoods, and sidewalk rescues. From floods to fires, there's been little relief. Across the West, more than 90 large wildfires are burning in a region mired in drought. Some 800,000 acres scorched from active fires as crews battle to gain the upper hand. The flames were 300 feet in the air. The trees were exploding. With entire communities under evacuations, in recent days, four have been killed trying to escape the flames. And now after this crash, three firefighting personnel nearly lost their lives also trying to battle them. Tonight, the West can't catch a break from a sudden season of extremes. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's legal team is not backing down. The team continues to oppose the U.S. Department of Justice, rejecting countless requests to view the top classified documents seized from Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. Former President Donald Trump's attorneys on Monday said they opposed the Justice Department's request to continue looking into classified documents the FBI seized from Mar-a-Lago in August in an ongoing criminal investigation. In the court filing, Trump's lawyers asked U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee in Florida, to require an independent arbiter, called a special master, to review all the documents recovered during the August search at Trump's estate in Palm Beach, including the roughly 100 files with classification markings, some labeled as top secret. Cannon has faced a criticism as she temporarily barred prosecutors from examining the seized records as they probe whether Trump took government property from the White House illegally or store the materials at Mar-a-Lago improperly. The arbiter will weed out any privileged documents that should be shielded. 
The Justice Department nominated two candidates to be the arbiter. Trump objected to both. Meanwhile, prosecutors have vowed to appeal Cannon's decision to a higher court if they're kept from accessing the records. Also in the filing, Trump's lawyers disputed the Justice Department's claim that the 100 records in question are in fact classified. And they said a president generally has broad powers to declassified records. However, they stopped short of suggesting that Trump had declassified those documents, a claim Trump has made on social media, but not in any court filings. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The FBI informed Twitter Incorporated of at least one Chinese agent working at the company's headquarters. U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley said during a Senate hearing where a whistleblower testified, raising new concerns about foreign meddling at the influential social media platform. With Twitter's fate as a publicly traded company still undecided, the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee heard explosive testimony about security practices there. Among the allegations was that Twitter knew it had both Indian and Chinese agents on its payroll. These workers would have had access to sensitive user data. The FBI notified Twitter of at least one Chinese agency in the, uh, agent in the country. A company, I should say. Uh, based on allegations, Twitter also suffers from a lack of data security. Whistleblower Peter Zatko was head of security until he was fired in January. He described a culture that valued profit over security, with the leadership habitually ignoring engineers' warnings about hacking and data theft. What I discovered when I joined Twitter was that this enormously influential company was over a decade behind industry security standards. The company's cybersecurity failures make it vulnerable to exploitation, causing real harm to real people. Twitter has dismissed Zatko's claims as a false narrative. His allegations could factor into the ongoing legal battle between Twitter and Elon Musk. The billionaire businessman is trying to pull out of a $44 billion takeover, claiming Twitter hid how many spam accounts it had to inflate its purchasing price. His lawyers already plan to use some of the whistleblower's complaints in their argument. Twitter shareholders voted on Tuesday to approve the initial deal. A court will begin hearing the case in October. Alphabet unit Google will face damage claims for up to 25 billion euros or 25.4 billion USD over its digital advertising practices in two suits to be filed in British and Dutch courts in the coming weeks by a law firm on behalf of publishers. Google faces damages claims of up to 25.4 billion dollars in the coming weeks. The Alphabet-run search giant is accused of unfair advertising practices. The two suits are due to be filed in British and Dutch courts. A law firm said on Tuesday that Google should pay back the damages it caused to EU and UK publishers. Antitrust regulators have investigated Google's advertising technology recently after complaints from publishers. The European Commission and the UK want to see whether the ad tech business gives Google an unfair advantage over rivals and advertisers. Google criticised the lawsuits and said it worked constructively with publishers across Europe. The British claim will aim to recover compensation for all owners of websites carrying banner advertising. The Dutch claim is open to publishers affected by Google's actions. Alphabet's Google has been hit by large fines in Europe recently. Last year, the French competition watchdog hit it with a 220 million euro penalty. The leader of the Catholic Church was supposed to meet with Russian Orthodox Church's Patriarch Kirill, but the tete-a-tete -tete will not take place after Kirill opted out of attending the conference. Pope Francis has arrived in Kazakhstan for an interfaith conference. The event is happening with the backdrop of the war in Ukraine and the Church's relationship with China. On Wednesday and Thursday, the leader of the Catholic Church will participate in the conference, where he was meant to meet his Russian Orthodox counterpart on the sidelines. However, Patriarch Kirill, a vocal supporter of Russia's so-called special operation in Ukraine, cancelled his visit last month. 
There are also no plans for Francis to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping, despite the two leaders being in Kazakhstan at the same time, according to the Pope. Beijing and the Vatican haven't had diplomatic relations for more than half a century, though in 2018 the two agreed on a controversial deal about the appointment of bishops. The exact details of the court are secret, and it has to be renewed every two years. During his stay, Pope Francis will also visit the small Catholic community in the Muslim-majority country that also has a strong Russian Orthodox presence. Health experts are warning of a simultaneous outbreak of COVID-19 and the flu in South Korea this fall, in what's being dubbed as a twindemic. As a result, experts are calling for a comprehensive medical response system to be put in place should such an outbreak occur. According to data compiled by the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, the number of patients displaying flu symptoms came to 4.7 for every 1,000 outpatients between August 28th and September 3rd. The figure shows a steady increase from the 3.3 reported four weeks earlier. With the continuous rise in the number of flu patients and a waning immunity on COVID-19, health experts warned that a simultaneous outbreak of COVID-19 and seasonal influenza, dubbed a twindemic, could hit South Korea over this fall and winter. And now, they're calling for a thorough medical response system to be in place in the event of such an outbreak. Experts say a COVID-19 surge coinciding with the spread of flu could cause major confusion and could result in a rapid increase of serious cases that could affect the medical system nationwide. One solution, they say, is the need for a PCR test designed to detect the flu and COVID-19 at the same time, as antigen tests have limitations. And this is all the more important, as there are individual treatments in place for both COVID-19 and the flu. With the country set to enter the first winter season without social distancing rules since the COVID-19 outbreak, experts are also calling for a vaccination plan for people to be able to get the COVID-19 and flu vaccines together. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Kenya has a new president following the swearing-in of William Ruto. In an official ceremony in the capital Nairobi, the self-proclaimed hustler was sworn in. At least 11 people were killed after a bus reportedly carrying 36 passengers fell into a gorge in India's Jammu and Kashmir region. A lawsuit accusing Mercedes-Benz of infringing on people's freedoms by exacerbating climate change was dropped by the Stuttgart District Court, but the German climate NGO behind the case said it planned to appeal. Scuffles broke out in Senegal's parliament as lawmakers met for the first time since an election in which President Macky Sall's ruling coalition lost its comfortable majority. A broad sell-off sent U.S. stocks reeling after a hotter-than-expected inflation report dashed hopes that the Federal Reserve could relent and scale back its policy tightening in the coming months. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you have missed any of the stories tonight, you can re-watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with visitors flocking into the mythical world of Korean folklore. Thank you for joining us. Good night.